Big Dark, Born Peace by Rob Harper. Chapter 4 I make my way to the supposedly abandoned school that Demas is using. At least that's what my now dead snitch said. The question is, if this is a trap, then why did Demas spring it so early by sending Rob's body through my window? Oh well, I guess there's only one real way to find out. I consider just walking in the front door and getting it over with, but then the slight hope that Rob didn't sell me out to Demas pokes his head up. I decide to look for another means of entrance. I sneak around the school's decaying exterior and see some well-dressed thugs through some windows. Once I make my way to the back, I see some others smoking some butts by the back door. The flare of their matches gives them away instantly. So now I have to try and figure out a way into the place. The ground floor looks pretty busy, so I try the second story. I climb up a drain pipe, which I'm sorry to say isn't the first time I've done this, and find a small window that I squeeze my frame into. I land awkwardly in the bathroom, which looks like it hasn't been used since the school was put out of service. I think I disturbed a rat's nest. A few of the critters scurry past me in the gloom. So much for the grand entrance. I wipe the rat's crap off my pant knees with some old decaying paper I find. After cleaning myself sufficiently, I crack the bathroom door ever so slightly and peek into the adjoining hallway. It's the usual long hallway, which once would have been filled with many little beggars wishing they weren't here. Last time I was in a place like this, it was at the age of 14. After that, I was homeschooled in an orphanage. Now that I had successfully broken into a warehouse of the top mobster in Chicago, my plan of breaking in and heroically rescuing my friend seems a little foolish. First of all, I don't even know if Paul's being held here. Demas has a lot of these places all over the city. So what to do next? My next step is to walk out of the bathroom as quietly as possible and try to think of a plan. That is when I hear the voice behind me. Looking for something more? The voice sends me traveling back to those days at the orphanage. I knew I started thinking about that for a reason. I turn to face the voice and there is Carl Thulu with a bunch of hoods that I'd seen earlier. Some of the nicer dressed ones are brandishing gats, while the others tend to have wrenches and pipes from what I could see. It's been a while, Carl. Nice to see you again. Shame about the company you're keeping. So which one of these plugs spotted me going in the window? Carl smiles and motions towards one of the smokers I saw earlier. The guy nods and smiles and I know I'm screwed. There are too many of them and I doubt I can run without getting clipped, nor can I talk my way out. What now, Carl? I start to raise my hands. Now comes my favorite part of the job. I almost see Carl smirk, but the pain is replaced by a bright white light which is accompanied by a sharp pain to the back of my head. Bring him. These are the last words I hear from my childhood nemesis before everything goes black. Chapter 5 The first time I met Carl was in 1932, and I was 15. I'd been living with my aunt on her farm. My mother died when I was born, and my father died in the war. It was an okay life, but it ended one day when I was told my aunt was dead, and I was brought to an orphanage. As I stepped up to the old plantation house outside of New Orleans, it was raining, and I was soaked to the skin. All I had in my possession was a letter and a busted up suitcase. I rang the doorbell and a portly man opened the door and looked down at my nearly drowned, skinny frame. I sheepishly looked up. What you want? It was the first words I heard out of my new guardian's mouth. I stuck out my hand and gave the man the letter. The man looked it over and then looked down at me. He smiled a slightly wolfish grin. You a name? One piece? That ain't no real name. I just stared at the man as he waited for a response. Seems your aunt died, boy. No parents neither. Well, it looks like this will be your new home. Name's Ray. I'll be looking after you. The man moved aside and motioned for me to enter. I entered a warmly lit foyer and started to drip all over the carpet. Take off that coat and your boots and drop the case down there. Come now, I'll show you the rest. I did as I was told. I looked at the man out of the corner of my eye, not knowing what to expect. The man patted me forward into a large room. Within was a warm-looking fireplace, to which I would have rushed to try and warm up if I hadn't seen the rest of the teens in the room. Standing to one side was a taller boy, who was a few years older than me. Over there, that's Carl. Not another one. Sitting on a couch was a younger Asian girl who had many facial piercings. I tried not to stare. She smiled at my attempts. Hello, I'm Nema. It's nice to make your acquaintance. From a chair facing away from me popped out a face of a heavily tattooed black boy about my age. I was startled, but the boy smiled back. Well, sorry. I do get that a lot. My name's Colm. From a doorway, another head popped out to see the newcomer, but disappeared as soon as I looked his way. Don't worry about Pierce. He's a little shy. And all the time I spent at the orphanage, that was as much as I'd ever see of Pierce, really. 
Just then, from another doorway, walked in a beautiful young girl holding a plate of cookies. I couldn't help but stare. Somewhere inside of me, I felt that this girl was the only one for me. She smiled. And this is Blue. At least that's what she calls herself. Hello! These were the first words Blue ever said to me. Not too shocking, I know, but it still made me feel warm inside. Hello, I'm Warren. I guess I live here now. It's all I could think to say. Then welcome home. Blue offered me a cookie, and we sat around the fire. I was feeling self-conscious from all the stares, but I continued to eat my cookie and tried to get warm in silence. So this was my first introduction to that place that would become my home for the next few years. Over those years, all of us became good friends, with the exception of Pierce, whom I've already mentioned kept to himself in the attic room, and of course Carl. Carl and I could never get along. He had been the first orphan in the house, and thus everyone else was a newcomer. And also, we were both in love with Blue. Ray was the worst guardian someone could have. This was not to say he abused or mistreated us, he just didn't give a damn. We would party and drink while he shot dope and passed out. The only reason any of us got any education was because of Blue, who would make us read and learn. Carl always insisted we were special. He called us demons. I really didn't listen. Colm became my best friend, and after a while I barely noticed the tribal tattoos all over his face. He once told me it had been done while he was very young, and no one ever pressed him about them. He and Nima became a couple over the years. She was quite pretty even with the multiple piercing in her ears, nose, and eyebrows. She said it increased her magic, and I just assumed she was nuts, although she could do some crazy amazing stuff sometimes. Lastly, there was Blue. Blue was the heart and soul of our group. To look at her was to love her. This is not to say she was a perfect beauty, it was just she had a certain something about her. She even could keep Carl and I from fighting. Both Carl and I were deeply in love with Blue. She was a few years older than us, but it didn't matter. We both had been vying for her affection for a couple of years, but she tended to keep us both at a distance. Neither of us could say that they didn't have a chance and give up, and yet neither could claim any sort of relationship other than friendship with Blue. The last summer that we were all at the house, the whole situation with Carl, Blue, and I started to come to a head. Carl and I had been on opposite sides of Blue for so long that we were no longer speaking to each other. One night we were having a party, as we tended to do on warm southern summer nights, and a lot of alcohol was being consumed. Even Pierce had come down to get drunk and forget his gloom. Carl had drunk way more than his share and was being unusually forceful with Blue. You have to choose between war and me. I can't make that choice. I came upon the scene and soon the two of us got into a shouting match. Blue couldn't take any more. I can't take this anymore. I'm going for a walk. When I tried to follow her, Carl grabbed my arm and we faced off. A few drunk and ineffective blows got thrown before the other housemates pulled us apart. Both Carl and I headed out in opposite directions to try and find Blue. Hours later, I was woken by a loud knock at my door. I hadn't found Blue the night before, and after asking around, neither had Carl. This didn't worry me so much, though. Blue was a big girl, and she could handle anything out there, and she had done this before. I got up and answered the knock. It was Nima, and she'd been crying. Silently, she led me downstairs, where a policeman was standing holding his hat in the foyer. I was the last of the boarders to make it to the hall, and the rest looked shell-shocked. Carl was leaning against a wall on the ground, sobbing, and I knew what had happened instantly. Blue had died. The policeman clarified the situation. Blue had been murdered. I nearly fainted. To be continued. And now a message from the man of four voices, Jack Flake. Please, if anyone would just buy some merchandise so I could not have to work as a telemarketer, I beg of you. Thanks, Jack. And please visit cafepress.com slash Vinland Old Time Radio to get any merchandise you might be interested in. It would help us out a lot. Thank you and keep listening.